Welcome to Bread and Roses. Hi everyone, I'm Maren Namazi. And I'm Fadi Wolf Puya. In this week's program, we're going to be talking about the astounding protests Beautiful. in Beautiful. Iran and uh, the need to support it internationally. We'll also be talking about the veiling of children and this incident against a girl gymnast who happened to not be veiled. Interview this week is with Suada Stalomovic, uh, one of the survivors of uh, Bosnian genocide. Our fatwa insanity this week is about not being allowed to criticize uh, the veil. It's just not allowed and it comes Elec via electronically. electronic fatwas. And our slice of life is from Tunisia and the establishment of the first LGBT radio station there. Stay with us, don't go away. Iran has been rocked by mass protests over the f past few days in numerous cities, Zahedan, uh, Mashhad, Shiraz, Yaz, Khoramabad, Khoramshar, you name it. There have been protests there against poverty, unemployment, rising prices and repression and dictatorship. Absolutely, and you can see this. The nature of the protest is um, looking at the totality of the Islamic regime started with um, protest against corruption, uh, abject poverty that the Islamic regime has imposed on all sections of society in Iran, political repression, all of those. You, we've seen continuous uh, demonstrations in various parts of Iran. Labor uh, wages haven't been paid, a lot of people haven't been paid for month and after month. And all of these are linked with the leaders of the Islamic regime and the complete lack of regard for uh, people's welfare. You, we, we saw uh, the situation after the earthquake, that people were left with no support at all. All of that pressure is now come to a head and demonstrations and protests are starting everywhere aimed at totality of the struggle. Yeah, and the, the, you can tell from the slogans as well. It says, down with Khamenei, and also down with Rouhani. And from the slogans, you can see that it is aimed at the repression of the regime as well. You know, it says down with Khamenei, but also down with uh, uh, Rouhani. It talks about livelihood, dignity is our basic right. You know, there's slogans about freedom, freeing political prisoners and jailed labor and student activists and on and on. And of course, even Islam is being targeted. You know, one of the slogans is Islam has been used as a step to frustrate and make the lives of people miserable. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the other um, uh, thing is that the role of uh, young people in these protests and actually all sections of society, um, they've come together to protest against the situation, and particularly young people and women have yeah. been a major factor and in spreading this protest. Definitely yeah. this is a woman's, a female a revolution, a female protest. It's very clear right from the start. A lot of the iconic videos and photos that are coming out of the protest are by women. So there's a woman waving her, her white hijab, uh, standing on a, you know, on a plinth somewhere, and there's another woman screaming at security forces on her own saying down with Khamenei and of course uh, others... Which is a taboo actually, they, they always yeah. try to say do anything you want but do not aim at the leader of the Islamic Republic because he is sacred, he represents God and you can see that people are actually in, 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 facing and, you know, and, and saying down with uh, uh, Khamenei yeah, and the head of the Islamic regime of Iran. That, that means totality. Of course different sections of uh, different factions of the Islamic regime try to sort of blame each other on the protests, but it's very clear this is not uh, one section against the other, it's people of Iran against the Islamic yeah, Republic. Definitely. Of and of course you do have uh, reactionaries trying to take advantage of these protests, one by pushing their own reactionary agendas in Iran, uh, in Iranian politics, but also you know you hear uh, the Trump administration talking about how wonderful it is that people in Iran are protesting. You know, we have a message for the US government, hands off Iran. It's because of US foreign policy that there is an Islamic regime to begin with in Iran. Uh, there's the 1953 coup in Iran. It's a continuous, you know, causing of mayhem and trouble, not just in Iran, but in the Middle East and North Africa. 
the U.S. brings only bad news to a place and, like and, Iran. And, and, and we don't want them absolutely. there. Absolutely. And I think that the thing is that they unleash the most reactionary element. They have the intervention. We've seen that in Syria. We've seen that in Iraq. We, we've seen that in Middle East. In and Afghanistan. And, and in yeah. different parts. They always back the most reactionary elements against people's right and dignity and civil liberties. So the best thing for Trump administration is to keep out of the situation uh, in Iran. People of Iran can sort the Islamic Republic of Iran out. They, they'll sort them out by... by yeah, but what, what is important is people-to-people -people solidarity. And that's hugely important. People need to support the protesting people of Iran. They're doing it at great risk, with great bravery and courage. They're facing a really beastly uh, regime. And they need real solidarity, human inter solidarity. International support everywhere. People need to spread the news and be very clear what people want. They don't want reform of the Islamic regime of Iran. They don't want this, that and the other. They don't want a foreign intervention in, in country in the Middle East. What they want is dignity, peace, uh, society. Livelihood, uh, yeah, you know, that, that sort of thing, the basic fundamentals of uh, civil society. That's what we need to support. And that's we ask everybody who sees this program to support the people of Iran and organize any way you are organizing support of uh, the protesters in Iran. One of the things uh, that is important to discuss when we're discussing the veil is the issue of child veiling. You know, we, we have often talked about how this is completely different than adult veiling, isn't it? It's a form of child abuse. It's sexualizing children at such a young age. And this is something you come up and it's, against yeah, all the time. And we've got something in the news now in Iran, don't we? Yeah, the, uh, a child who's 13-year-old, apparently, um, uh, the photographs has been published in the social media. She's been practicing and taking part in competition in um, Armenia. Um, she's traveled with her parents over there. And when they've gone back to Iran, the Islamic regime of Iran's uh, Ministry of Institution of Sport has decided to discipline the child and the family, and it's calling for disciplinary action. Yeah, and they've said that, you know, she's dressed in the way that non-Muslims dress when they uh, go into gymnastic competitions. They've also said that this is not something that is deserving of uh, the Islamic regime of Iran and of Iranian women. Now, first of all, this is a child. Second of all, what's good for the Islamic regime of Iran is definitely not good for Iranian women and girls and people in general. So there's a big conflict there. But the whole fact that this has become a huge issue, it's a child, for goodness sakes, going and doing gymnastics. And what's yeah. interesting too is, you know, they've said, we don't have women's gymnastics because how can you do gymnastics with a chador on or a yeah. veil on? It's impossible. But that they're thinking of doing no, they've said, of course, women, and, Islamic women. And, and the woman gymnastics. in charge of, the woman, Islamist woman in charge of the uh, Women's Federation of Gymnastics in Iran said, of course, we don't, we don't have a team at the moment to, to compete. What are we planning for the next two years? I have no idea what they're planning for the next two years. Exactly. It's like non-existent. Islam and the sports and it's and women's sports and women's in sport. It's a no-no. It stops people taking part in competition, developing, competing, taking part in the st in the sports. Islam doesn't like that sort of thing. Yeah, That's why and also, I mean, we, we're seeing this. Not this is not the first time this has happened. There have been so many other women athletes uh, and sports people who've been banned because they've either not been veiled or they're improperly veiled and so on and so forth. So someone in the bill billiards team, you have the chess player yes. who uh, was again barred from playing because she played chess in Spain without her veil on. So this is an ongoing thing. And also, uh, you know, women are not allowed to take to uh, enter the stage f sports and stadium and, and be a spectators in Iran mm -hmm. and they have to be separated, they can't see, uh, you know, the opposite sex competing. The whole Islamic regime is wrong yeah. when it comes to sports. Um, and in and particular, well. uh, in particular, when it comes to children and young people who are developing as part of development, they need to take part in the sports. They stop them, and this is what they're doing, and it's ridiculous. What yeah, it doing is ridiculous. Child. And one of the things that we often uh, have said before as well is the way that the discussion on the veil in the West is so sanitized. You know, they talk about rights and choice, but in actuality, this is what it means. You know, you get disciplined if you're a 13-year-old girl and you happen to. Uh, be wear, you know, not be veiled and wearing your 
your sports uniform, which is like a gymnastics uniform, you are going to be disciplined as a result. You know, it's it's. Uh, can you imagine how traumatic it must be for that That's girl? Hard. Gymnast yeah. uh, and the father has to come and explain what he's done and what's happened and it's just really outrageous, isn't it? So again, you know, this is something very sinister. This sort of veiling, and especially when it comes to child veiling, it's nothing short of child abuse. So uh, welcome, and uh, we are uh, very happy to have someone like you on our program. Thank you for speaking with us. Uh, we wanted to find out about the women's court that you were involved with as a witness and the fact that you testified about genocide that took place in your village. Can you tell us how that process affected you? How helpful was it? I, I believed in in court system. I waited for so long and the pers persecution started, the court started in 2000 and, and in 2005 process started. Uh, this process started first in Belgrade, uh, the process about concerning killing of 700 people in Zvornik and it was concerning only Serbian nationals who, who only people who were in who had command responsibility who were in decision making positions were those who were prosecuted at that point first first, first case was only concerning 170 people who were murdered. They couldn't, they couldn't build a case for more murdered people because they couldn't be found. They were in mass graves. With help of humanitarian fund, uh, they achieved for this case to be expanded to to concern all 700 people who who were murdered. In five years, every, tw twice every month in in course of five years, I went to the court. I I experienced a harassment from families of ac accused people, of people who committed those crimes, and even those perpetrators of crimes were threatening us. At that point, I met women in black, and that's how we started cooperating. I, I expected justice to be served, but the results were different. The man who was in charge of Zvornik, who was in, in command and making decisions, he was sentenced only five years. On that day, when sentence was passed, he was already released because the process lasted for five years and he was uh, incarcerated for that time. When, when, when judge read the decision and when she said that they are taking into account the age of the perpetrator, his old age and uh, his sickness, families couldn't stand there, stay there and listen to the judge and they asked what about the victims, what about young people who, who were killed by this man. This, this, same, this same man lives today in my town. He, he, he lives there, he walks there freely, and even he works in a local government, and I am seeing him every day. Uh, we don't have any, any cases against the people who, who were following orders in this crime, who, who were direct perpetrators uh, and there is only one person who survived this ordeal. We as witnesses, we women, are only witnessing the point of event when we were banished, when we were expelled and 
how they divided us from other people. Uh, we found 500 remains and we are still looking for 200 people that are missing. They were put in mass graves when they were killed, but to cover the tracks of this crime, they were dug, dug out and put into secondary mass graves. It is, it is very hard for, for our community. There were 17 villages where people were displaced, and from those villages, young men and boys were taken. The mothers remain, mothers who lost two sons and husbands, who remained alone, and these are very hard, hard times for, for them. I'm, I'm afraid that we will not see the justice served. Uh, 25 years had passed, and we still haven't seen any justice. But I'm, I'm still hoping for this justice that it, it will be achieved. But witnesses are dying. I mean, uh, how, how do you? Uh survive such terror and horror and uh, go to court and continue to fight for justice after so many years. How do you do it? In the beginning it was very hard. I was banished with uh, three children. One was eight months, six and a half years and and six, six and, and five, and five years old. So eight months, five years old, and six and a half year. When my husband was taken away, they put them on the one side, put them in the trucks, on the one side men, men and on the other side women and children. From, from, from that, that point, I went through six different, after four, four years, I went to my parents who were in free territory in Bosnia. Then I started to fight to, re to regain my house. Home, I re-entered my home in year 2000. Our houses, our houses were severely demolished and destroyed. Only few of us went back into village. We were not let let in in greater number. Only few of us reached back into village. Then, then we needed to legally fight to get into possession of our land. Our, all, all, all our land was transferred, ownership rights, ownership rights were transferred to some Serbs who settled there who settled, who settled there from another part. I, I fought for myself and for my children, and I found myself in situation, same situation as other mothers who also came back. I, I, I brought together those women, those mothers, and we started to help each other. At first, I helped myself first, and I fought for my house and my property, because when I came back to village, I couldn't enter my property. And after I did that, I helped other women achieve the same, and we helped each other. We started meetings and organizing. There is this one anecdote. When we started, before we started organizing, uh, there was a lo local government official. I don't know how he was appointed that because majority of majority of people in village were women. There was only two men, but there was this government official, local government official, who was man, who was male, and he told us that for us women, it's very dangerous to go to Zvornik to do the paperwork for our property. So he advised us to give him money for his services, so he will finish paperwork and sort it out for us. And then I, I told him that I don't know how you were elected here, but it should be otherwise. We women should be up here where you are standing and you should take our place. And in such way our act activism and our fight began. This is how I, I start. This is how everything started. But the way I fought for myself at first, 
how how I managed to get people out of my house who moved into my house, into my property, was in finding out who who they were and where they were from, and then I tracked them, tracked their property in Sarajevo, found it was empty and no one was living there, and I then I managed to file the paperwork for them to return to their own property and move out of mine. After everyone, everyone saw what I have done, it took me only two months to go through this process, even though before that some women doubted me and, and told me not to stand out. When everyone saw that I managed to regain my property back, then they started supporting me and, and they saw that we don't need three men uh, telling everyone what to do and that we, we have power to do this ourselves. So when, when, we, when we organized and we got everyone's property sorted and we helped uh, other women with psychological problems and that were a result of war. And then we started empowering each other and helping with economic empowerment with having so, our so, properties so back, we started rebuilding our communities and our homes. Now everyone, everyone can see and compare how it was in the beginning and how everything looks now. We, we fought and we got results. We have our children in schools and our children educated. And I'm very, very pleased for all women that, that we achieved this. Also, one, one, important, one important question that I still ask myself after going through all this ordeal is how, how, have I, I re, how I retained my sanity and how I re, remained normal, so to say. So I had to be a man, a woman, a teacher, a physicist, a, both in my family and in our organization. Um, so it's, it's basically a village of women, really, isn't it? It is village of women, village of widows. But this, this, this word, widow, is affecting me, hurting me. I don't know how to explain it. I, I can understand for myself, I had children to work for, but there were women who, who lost their children, who who remained alone, but still they worked and worked and fought and went forward. Uh, can I ask you, um, you know, you keep talking about the need for justice, to get justice. Why is it so important, do you think, for you and for all the others who have gone through this, this genocide and tragedy? It is because of future. If someone has done something and they are not punished, what can we expect of future, of tomorrow. Uh, are you um, hopeful about tomorrow? I cannot dwell in the past, but I'm fighting for tomorrow. I'm fighting for better tomorrow, and I believe it, there will be better tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you. I hope uh, people everywhere continue to support you, and uh, you have many um, people who can see your strength and are so inspired and encouraged by you. Uh, th thank you for listening to me, for hearing my story. But it, 25 years of life put in 10 minutes, there are even more stories to be, to be told. has issued a fatwa via its electronic center. So it's, it's very modern. Very modern. Very issuing modern medieval people. fatwas via electronics. Still modern? Yeah. Is electronic. It's electronic. No way it's coming through. Yeah, exactly. And they've, effective. they've issued a fatwa that says uh, that the veil is compulsory end of story. It's in Islam, compulsory. Don't talk about it. You're not allowed to have an opinion on it. Uh, well, unless you're specialized. 
unless you're given the fast part, because part of the argument that put forward is it protects women, mm -hmm. makes them independent, mm -hmm. makes them productive, mm -hmm. uh, avoids being seen as a commodity, blah, blah, and blah. the body is, then is not an issue. I don't know why I'm hearing this. Um, so there is an opinion, you could actually debate it only one way, yeah. for people to actually agree with her job as compulsory. If you deny compulsory. the compulsory nature of the veil, you're not allowed to say it. I don't you're think not, so. Uh, I don't, I don't think know. we're listening. Uh, I don't think we should be debating this now. We're not listening to the You just one. announce and say it's... That's how it goes. It goes one direction. It's not... You can't debate. You can't challenge. You know. <laughs> Electronic <laughs> mother. <laughs> <laughs> and they've said that if you deny this compulsory veiling, it, you're being an extremist and you're being abnormal. Completely. And also you're denying the fact that this is the women's feminine nature to have a, a sack on their heads. Yes, yeah, well, mm. I think, yeah. you know, I don't think they're going to win on this argument, are they? No, they've already lost badly. And I'm Fadi Bospuya. We're hosting a program called Bread and Roses. It's a weekly program that's broadcast in Persian and English in the Middle East and North Africa, primarily Iran as well. And it's also shown on YouTube internationally. And we've been doing this since last May. We're coming up to a year's anniversary and yeah. we, we've had quite a lot of fun making these videos. We discuss taboo breaking, free thinking ideas. The Islamic regime of Iran has called us immoral and corrupt and that's why the, you need to support us we are and the vo alternative voice in Middle East and North Africa of corruption and immorality so do support us here's a short video from patreon that explains how you can help us with even just one dollar a week that's nothing support us patreon lets fans become patrons of their favorite artists and content creators it's different than Kickstarter because it's not about one big project that requires lots of funding. It's more for bloggers or YouTubers or webcomics, anyone who creates on a regular basis. Here's how it works. When you become a patron, you're agreeing to give an artist a tip of an amount you set every time they release a piece of content, whether it's a new song, a video, or a recipe. You can set a monthly maximum to make sure that you're always within your budget. Choose an amount, enter your payment information, and you're done. Becoming a patron allows you to view and post in the artist's stream, and in exchange for your support, artists offer additional patron packages, which might include monthly Google Hangouts, music production tutorials, pre-sale concert tickets, or anything they can offer as a way to say thanks. Patreon, empowering a new generation of content creators. <laughs> 